chapter 6, if you want to open up your Bibles and turn there. Um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about prayer. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what prayer is, what prayer isn't. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about when you should pray. Um, but before we do that, uh, I just want to take a moment um, to pray and usher the Spirit of God into this space. Lord, we're remiss to think that we can pray without your presence. And so, God, in this moment, may we be reminded, Lord, that, that what we desire is not just to talk, is not just to listen, but to hear the living God and to speak with our creator. May we be reminded, Lord, that this is an act of worship, that God, though a guitar has stopped playing or a piano's stop being played, Lord God, that, that you are hearing us, Lord, and that it's like a sweet fragrance to you, God, in worship. Lord, as we pray tonight, uh, my prayer, Lord, is that we would believe what we just sang, that we would make room for you to do whatever you want to, Lord. Lord, I think um, by way of confession, we need to be honest and truthful that we don't always mean what we sing in worship songs. Maybe we just sing along, or maybe our heart's not in it, or maybe our head is somewhere else. And so tonight, God, what we're asking is that you would turn our attention, that you would uh, tune our hearts to the beat of yours, and that you would speak, Lord, because your servants are listening to you. So tonight, God, as we, uh, we learn about prayer, as we're reminded of who you are, may you stir us and guide us, lead us and shape us. And we all pray these things in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Um, hey, family. Well, I'm so grateful uh, that you've chosen to be with us tonight. And, and uh, I, I've been so just blessed by this service um, and not just this service, but specifically this series that we've been going through. Um, anyone else been blessed by this Holy Habits series? Let me tell you. Um, I, I think the two messages that, that have impacted me the most so far have been the one that um, Kimmy, our youth leader, spoke on submission. Um, and then the, the message last week on, on worship by Isai, our worship director. Um, th there are times where you hear a message and there are times where like, your soul hears what it needs to hear. And, and I just encourage you that, that you've been getting some really good teaching from our team over the last few months. Can you just take a moment and thank our team for the great teaching that they've been doing? So good and so powerful. Um, I wanna, wanna start tonight by uh, addressing uh, Pastor Apostle Larry Wachemeyer um, for his uh, misquotes in public. Um, you have grandchildren. Uh, their names are Aslan and Caspian and Leo, Leo. So um, I don't know why you keep having grandchildren boys, but um, you have grandchildren, not just in the spirit, but whenever you want them, you can have them. Just want to say that right now. Are we recording? OK, I just want to make sure online you heard that whenever you want them, whenever you want them, OK? Um, well, family, I'm, I'm grateful to be with you tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about prayer. And uh, if, as you turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be in verses 5 through 14. Um, but here's what it, I want you to get out of the big idea tonight. The big idea is this, is prayer is the most powerful tool that we've been given. The most powerful tool that we've been given. Um, I've been learning uh, as I've been picking up a, a new sport how important tools are. Um, you know, there, there are sports that require little tools and there are sports that require many tools. And one of those sports that I've been picking up recently uh, is golf. And, and what I've been learning about golf is that if you don't have the right tool for the right situation, it is very hard to play golf. Actually, even if you have the right tool for the right situation, um, let me just be honest. For me, it's very hard to play golf, okay? Um, but I believe that prayer is the most powerful tool 
that the Christian has been given. Now, here's what I wanna be clear about is that uh, prayer is not your armor and prayer is not your weapon, but it is the tool that helps you fine tune your life. It is not your armor and it is not your weapon. This, this is your weapon. And you're to use this to fight the enemy. And God has given you a full armor. If you don't know it, look to Ephesians 6. You'll be reminded of it. But, but I do want to remind you tonight that, that prayer is this fine-tuning tool that you've been given to help you live out this life with Jesus. Someone once said this, an unanswered prayer is an unprayed prayer. An unanswered prayer is an unprayed prayer. So let's talk a little bit about what prayer is. Well, I would say this, by the most basic definition of prayer, prayer is simply talking to God. It is a, a, a conversation with your creator. Prayer is not just meditation or passive reflection. It is a, a direct address, uh, a letter written, a, a conversation had, a phone picked up with the God that has not only created you, but sustains you every day. It's the communication of, of the human soul with the Lord who created that very soul. See, prayer is the primary way for believers in Jesus to communicate their emotions, their, their desires with God, to, to fellowship with God. And in the Bible, prayer is described as seeking God's favor in Exodus 32, 11. In 1 Samuel 1, 15, it's described as pouring your soul out to the Lord. In 2 Chronicles 32, 20, it's described as crying out to heaven itself. In Psalm 73, 28, it's, it's described as drawing near to God. And Ephesians 3, 14, it's kneeling before your father. See, the, the Bible contains many examples of prayer and, and gives plenty of exhortations that we should be praying. Uh, Luke 18, Romans 12, Ephesians 6, I could go on and on and on. Mark 11 reminds us that God's house should be a house of prayer. And that God's people are to be a people of prayer. Jude 1, 20 verses, uh, verses 20 through 21 says this, Dear friends, by building yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourself in God's love. And tonight I want to talk a little bit about the prayer that God taught us to pray. The prayer that God taught us to pray. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 14, starting in verse 5. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the street corners. Why? To be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling on like the pagans for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Let that sink in for a moment. This then is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But listen to this closing sentence. But if you do not forgive others of their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Lord, tonight we pray that huh, we, we would pray earnestly as if, God, you are really real and you are really listening. God, that you are really here and that you really have a plan for tonight. To you be the glory and the honor and the praise. Amen. So let, let me ask you, um, when, when should you pray? Um, let, me, let me give you some funny examples of when you should pray. You should definitely be praying when the LA Rams are losing like they've been lately. Um, you, you should pray when Pastor Joel books an Airbnb for you. That's an inside joke. You know what I'm talking about. 
Um, you should pray when you get on an airplane, how those things fly in the sky, I don't know. You should pray when you're driving in the car with my sister-in-law, Kimmy. <laughs> but this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, worry about nothing, pray about everything. Worry about nothing, pray about everything. Paul wrote it like this in Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. Look to somebody around you, say, in every situation. Yeah, you know how you just made it weird with that person you didn't look at? Now look at them, say, in every situation. By prayer and petition, now don't keep talking to them, with thanksgiving, Present your requests to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we should always be praying, not just be praying when we want what we want or we're afraid that we won't get what we want, but in everything, in every situation, don't worry or be anxious. Why? Because God always has an answer when you pray. But, but can I... Can I just, can I encourage you real quick tonight? It's not always the answer that you want. Actually, you know what I found is usually not the answer that you want. Why? Because his way is better. His understanding is higher. So if we should pray about everything in every situation, not just when we're driving with somebody who doesn't know how to drive or when our sports teams are losing, or Pastor Joel is booking. Pastor Joel, I just forgive you for what you did at that Airbnb publicly. I release that. Forgive one another and your sins will be forgiven. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Thank you. What should we pray about? What should we pray about? I, I encourage you, pray about everything. Not just your problems, but God wants to talk to you about everything. Everything. Everything that's in your life you should be praying to God about. See, prayer is meant to be a conversation. Like, you should be that weird person that seems like they're talking to themselves because you're talking with God. You know that person? Like, since the invention of Bluetooth, the world has gotten so weird. You be in a grocery store, you think somebody's talking to you, or I do because I'm an extrovert and I love talking with people, and I find out they're talking to Bluetooth. But we should be talking to God in the car. We should be talking to God on the way to work. We should be talking to God when we wanna talk back to other people. We should be talking to God all the time. See, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, it says this, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That, that means that you don't just pray for your food, you pray when you go to bed. You pray when you wake up. You pray when they're taking too long with your food. You know what I'm talking about? In our generation, we want it and we want it now. We pray for patience. We pray in every single situation. One of my favorite models for prayer is the Acts model. If you've been around the church for a while, you've heard of the Acts model before. It goes like this, give God adoration. See, it's a reminder that glorifying and exalting God is why you've been given breath in your very lungs, that you were made to praise him and you do good with your breath when you praise God, not curse him. His name shouldn't come out of your mouth when you stub your toe, but when you raise your hands, when you get on your knees, when you don't know what to do, you're to say, God, you know better and God, you are to be praised. He should be adored for who he is, who is he? He's a good, good father. He's a creator. He's a sustainer. He's a healer. He is a friend. God is to be adored for who he is. But he's also to be confessed to. He's also the one that knows everything. So you might as well talk to him about the things that you don't want him to know because he already knows. See, the word confess means to agree with. And when we confess our sins, we agree with God that we're wrong and that we've sinned against him and we want to be reconciled to him. And, and here, can I give you a secret? Every time you do that, God forgives you and he restores you and you have fellowship again with him. You see that in 1 John 1, 9. But also you should be giving God thanksgiving. That's the T. Philippians 4, 6, a reminder with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
So how's thanksgiving different from adoration? Well, the difference is that, that worship or adoration focuses on, on who God is and thanksgiving focuses on what God has done. Right. See, see, many of us live with a bad attitude in our lives because God is not doing what we want him to do in the moment. And if we would just stop and give thanks for all the things he has already done, then we would know how good he really is. I mean, when's the last time you stopped and said, God, I'm going to write down every single thing that you've done for me this week. And I'm going to start today by saying you woke me up in the morning because I don't know any of you that woke yourself up in the morning. See, we can thank God for his love, his salvation, his protection, his provision. But but the last the last one stands for S supplication. Somebody say supplication. Somebody just learned a new word tonight. See, that refers to prayer for others and others' needs. Hey, uh, you don't have a very deep prayer life if your prayer life is only about you. See, supplication is a request or a petition and, and we can pray to God for mercy, Psalm 4.1. How, how about we start praying for mercy for those that are not merciful to us? God, I'm frustrated with them. And what I really want you to do is uh, throw down lightning, you know, like thunder and, and James and John and, and just get rid of them, God. Just take them out. But you know what? God, be merciful with them. Or, or for leading, Psalm 5, 8 reminds us like that we should pray before we walk into a situation. Um, how many times do we play out going off on someone in our head instead of asking God to give us the play to forgive that person. Or, or for wisdom, maybe you don't know what to do. Like God, I don't know what I'm walking into or what I'm supposed to do. James 1.5 says, pray for wisdom and on and on and on. See, Paul encourages us uh, supplication for all the saints, Ephesians 6.18, which means this, pray diligently for everybody that you know in Christ. When's the last time that you didn't just pray to God about the list that you want, but about what you want for other people? See, supplication reminds you that, that you need other people and it's not just about you and God, but it's about you, God, and, and others. It, it reminds you that isolation's not good, that anger's not good, that resentment and bitterness are not good. But in the individualistic society that we live in, we like to believe that we can do it on our own and we're self-made. And God will show you real quick that you need other people. There's no special formula to pray. It's not magic. We don't do witchcraft in the church. We should just do it. We should just do it. See, Leonard Ravenhill says this, prayer is not a preparation for the battle, it is the battle. And he says this, prayer is the most unexplored area of the Christian life. Prayerlessness, man, this guy going deep, is disobedience. For God's command is that people ought always pray and not faint. To be prayerless is to fail God. For he says this, ask of me. Think about that. Jesus promises that whenever you ask, whenever you have conversation, you will always have an answer to God. So you can pray under all circumstances and, and prayer develops our relationship with God. It, it demonstrates trust and, and dependence on God. And God loves this exchange. Why? Because you're his child, just as we love this kind of exchange with our children. Let me tell you, um, I absolutely love when my kids come and ask me questions. It makes me feel wanted and needed, especially in a generation where kids are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. My kid will be watching Discovery Channel, spitting facts at me that I'm like, I did not know that. My, my kid came to me the other day, he goes, Dad, why is the sky blue? And I was like, hmm, that's a great question. Let me think back to science. I'm like, Lord, forgive my memory. Help me, Lord, I'm getting old. And I'm like, well, the light, and he goes, let me tell you. And he starts telling me why the sky is blue. This is a seven-year-old. But, but I love when he comes to me, think about this. He already knew the answer, but he wanted to ask me the question anyway because he wants to have conversation with me. I, I love my, my three-year-old Aslan because Aslan knows that food is his love language. 
Anyone in here? They wrote a book called Five Love Languages, but Aslan invented a sixth love language. It's called food, right? Feed me and I'm happy, right? And, and I love because anytime food is in front of him, he just closes his little hands and he says, bless you, Jesus, amen. <laughs> bless you, Jesus, amen, right? Shortest prayer ever, but he wants God to know that he needs to bless the food that he's about to eat. But lately we've been trying to turn the TV off and just have conversation. And it goes on and on and on and on and on. And they'll just talk and talk and talk and talk. But, but here's what I notice is that as soon as I put a screen in front of their face, they don't wanna have conversation anymore. How, how many of us miss a prayer life because TV is more important than God? Social media is more important than God. That YouTube video that we have to watch, that TV series on Netflix is more important than God. And the creator of the universe is knocking at the door of your heart. And instead we fill our heart with things that cannot satisfy. See, fellowshipping with God is the heart of prayer. And too often we lose sight of how to, how to simply just ask God. Can, can, I, can I encourage you tonight that no matter how simple your prayer is or what the language looks like, that God is not concerned with your grammar when you're praying. That, that God wants what's really down there in your heart. My, my favorite prayer is not from my three-year-old, but it's from one of my spiritual children. And every time we go to Korean barbecue, Ian Hauser bends over and folds his hands and he says, Lord, let this food be bomb diggity in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> amen. But he says amen like he means it. Amen. Like you can tell that he's thankful for Korean barbecue, if you know what I'm saying. See, when, when we make petition to God, we let God know exactly where we stand and what we like to see happen. In our prayers, we must admit that God is greater than we are. And ultimately, he knows what's best for every situation in our lives. God, God is good and he asks us to trust him. And, and in prayer, we essentially say, God, not, not my will, but your will be done. God, not my will, but your will be done. See, the key to answered prayer is praying according to the will of God in accordance with his word. Prayer is not seeking your will, but seeking to align yourself more fully with the will of God. You say, Pastor Sean, where do I get that? First John 5, James 4 reminds us, God doesn't want you to do it your way. God wants you to do it his way. So, so then that begs the question, well, like, how do we posture ourselves when we're praying, right? Because like, maybe if I put my face on the floor like Pastor Larry, God will hear my prayer better. Or, or maybe I just need to throw my hands up or, or my knees need to hit the floor. See, here, here's what I wanna encourage, encourage you with. We, we all pray in different postures and we all pray with different words, but we should all pray with the same faith and the same heart. The same faith and the same heart. You know, I, I love one of, one of my favorite people in the, in the whole world. Um, I just, Alberto. I, I love Alberto. Alberto has been a friend. He's been an accountability partner. He's been somebody that I've discipled and then has discipled me in any ways. I do want to make it clear because this is being recorded. I love my wife more. I just want everybody to know, Sarah, I love you more. I love my kids. I love Alberto, right? Alberto's right there, you know? Um, and, and when I'm not liking them, I love Alberto when I can talk to him. You know what I'm talking about? And uh, this is what I love about Alberto is Alberto and I always pray with the same faith and the same heart, but we never pray the same way. I pray loud, he prays quiet. I, I, I pray moving and he prays standing still. I, I'm the kind of person, I don't know about you, but when I'm praying, I gotta move. You know what I'm talking about? I gotta get up and walk and, and I gotta experience God. And Alberto will just sit there for hours in the same spot, quiet. I, I can't even pick out my clothes quietly. I don't know how he does it. He just sits there. But we pray with the same faith and we pray with the same heart. See, prayer can be audible or, or it can even be uh, silent. It can be private or public. It can be formal or informal. But, but here's what James teaches us in James 1.6. All prayer must be offered in faith. That's what the Bible says. In John 16, 23, in the name of the Lord, 
And Romans 8, 26, in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, and I love how the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia puts it. Christian prayer in its New Testament meaning is prayer addressed to God as the Father in the name of Jesus as mediator and through the enabling grace of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So what I want to remind all of us is that um, the Bible also says that the wicked have no desire to pray in Psalm chapter 10, verse four. Let that sink in for a second. Where is our desire meter to pray with God? But it also says that the children of God have a natural desire to pray in Luke 11. See, here, here's what I wanna encourage you. Prayer is not just getting what you want. It's spending time with God. And it's not just talking, it's listening. Sometimes the best way to pray is to simply say something like, you know, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I've been doing a lot of talking, God, and now I need to do a lot of listening. I, I love 1 Samuel 3. It, it, it's this incredible story of a, a young man that's learning to be a priest. He's learning to shepherd people. He's learning to help people hear the voice of God, and he needs to know the voice of God. So in 1 Samuel 3, it starts like this. Listen, now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And then after one, two, now a third time, the Lord called and said, Samuel. And Samuel got up and he, he went to Eli, his shepherd, and he said, here I am, you called me. Then Eli, Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So he told Samuel, go and lie down. And if he calls, do you say this? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and he laid down in his place. The Lord came and stood there calling as at the other time, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to this. See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone hears about it tingle. You, you know what I learned from that story? Not just that we're to listen, but every time we do listen, God's intention is to change something. It's to change the way we interact with relationships, to, to change our attitude, to, to change our posture, to change us. Prayer, prayer doesn't change God, but it moves God's attention to us and reminds us that he cares for us, that he's with us, that he's for us. So I wanna, I wanna take us as, as we end this to the Lord's prayer because who better to pray than Jesus? Can I get an amen? How did Jesus teach us to pray? Well, here, here's what we get. He teaches us to pray the Father's character. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. See, he says, contemplate and praise God for who he is. Remember that he's your father. Come to him personally in trust, reminding ourselves that it's all about him and all about his praise and all about his glory. See, the danger is the heart desires our praise and our glory. See, when you pray the father's character, it changes your character. But you're not just to pray for the father's character, you're to pray for the father's kingdom. He says, your kingdom come and your, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, so we're to pray, not just for God to take us to heaven, but for God to do something in us before we get to heaven. See what I'm saying? This, this reminder that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let, let me ask you the question. How does God's will get done on earth? Through us. In heaven, God's will and reign is being done all the time. And we'll be in that place one day or Jesus will come and he'll make all things new. There will be a day where God's will is done in perfection. But check this out. You get to practice doing God's will right here and right now. Every time you love somebody, every time you serve somebody, every time you're peaceful, every time you're patient, every time you do something that is undeserved, every time you act out of a place of self-control, every time you let the Spirit of God speak through you, every single time what you do is you allow God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. 
I wonder if maybe part of the problem of the world that we live in is that Christians aren't praying enough for God's will to be done and we're praying more for our will to be done. And so we're not seeing the kingdom come, but we're building our own little kingdoms that won't amount to anything. We're more concerned with our job than we are what God is calling us to. We're more concerned with relationships than we are the one who gave them to us in the first place. So we're to pray for the Father's character and the Father's kingdom, but also for the Father's provision. Give us today our daily bread, Jesus teaches us. And, and you know, not, not the little booklet daily bread, you know, the ones that Pastor Larry's been reading since they started. I don't know how many years ago that was, Pastor Larry, but they've been around for a little while. But, but he's, he's saying this, remember your needs for the day and say, God, you meet these needs. God, you provide, remembering the Lord is your provider. And, and here, can I, can I encourage you? Repent of your tendency to grab things that you want that you haven't asked God if you can have. Repent of your tendency to grab things that you want that you haven't asked God if you can have. Now, as a parent, let me just say that I do not like this. I do not like when people give my kid candy and they did not tell my kid to come ask me because I got to deal with the consequences of my kids eating candy on a Sunday at 2.30 when they have a meltdown and I got to figure out how to nap a child that is acting like they just had drugs for the very first time. Let that be a warning to each and every one of you. If you see little kids with light colored hair, they might be mine. Do not give them candy. But, but we're to pray, God, is this what you want for me? Lord, is this what you have for me? Instead of just rushing in the day to grab everything that we want. This petition. But we're also to pray for forgiveness. Forgive our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. See, restoring our relationship with God and each other we're to pray so that we avoid bitterness that grows through unforgiveness. We're to thank God for grace and mercy and pray that he would show the same to the people around us. Hey, you, you wanna forgive somebody and, and you wanna avoid bitterness? Do me a favor and write down everything that you did wrong this last month and be reminded that God has forgiven you of each and every single thing that you fell short of. That's right, you don't need to Facebook be it with that person that said that thing to you five years ago that you're still mad about that you still can't let go because they didn't say hi to you when you walked into the church and you're still walking around that person how many times did you ignore God and God didn't say well I'm just gonna ignore you something for us to process and think about. Forgive our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. G Jesus says it like this, if you go to offer a gift and you realize you have something unreconciled, leave the gift there at the altar, go and be reconciled. Can, can, can I just say, I, I think we lack power and authority from the Holy Spirit sometimes because we, we don't leave our gift at the altar to go to be reconciled. Instead, we come to church angry with other people and pretend like we're worshiping God. And then the whole time we're sitting there going, man, I just, oh, I wish they would. Oh, I'm so frustrated. Oh, if they just came up to me and said, I'm sorry, oh, we could get over this. And how many times do we go and try to serve God unreconciled to other people? God is saying, leave it. Leave it before you come and worship me. Leave it so that your heart can be open. Forgive those who have debts against you. Why? Because God forgave your debt. There's a story about that. I don't have a lot of time to share it, but, but basically if you don't, he says, you're gonna go to hell. That's a strong rebuke from God. I will not forgive you if you do not forgive them. That's a deep thing that we need to process. Can, can I let that not fly over anyone's head tonight? Do not walk out of this place with unforgiveness and bitterness in your heart. Do not let that poison damn you to hell. Do not let that kill your soul. Because you're just drinking poison, expecting somebody else to die. 
It doesn't make sense. Lastly, the father's guidance says, don't lead us into temptation. And the father's protection deliver us from the evil one. See, God is our security. He is our protection. And praying for courage to live out our faith wholeheartedly despite uh, the risk and the confusion or how people will make fun of us. Family, can, can I tell you that, that there are Christians right now all over the world that to utter the name of Jesus is a death sentence and they do it anyway. Why? Because they believe that what they believe is really real. And we're afraid to share our faith because somebody might laugh at us or be confused by us. Oh, my neighbors think I'm weird. Can I just say that right now? If you move in my neighborhood, you're gonna hear worship music. You're gonna hear me talking to God while I'm walking and praying. And I'm loud, my volume button is broken. I only have high, there is no low. So when I talk to God, you can hear me three streets over. I live on 63rd, but if you live anywhere between that and 67th, you might hear me praying out in the middle of the street. See, I'm not afraid for people to know that I need God. And, and I think we need to be more bold to, to say, God, I need your protection. God, I need your guidance. God, I can't do this on my own. How many people would come to God if we just showed them that he is the daily bread and that he could feed them? But here we are starving, acting like we have everything that we need and we wonder why people aren't coming to Jesus. Family, can I say, prayer should lead to obedience. Prayer should lead to obedience. It should inspire and move you to do something. Um, one of the great preachers of our generation, John Tyson, he, he spent much of his life studying revivals. And do you know what he found? He found that, that every great story of revival from the disciples in the upper room to the second great awakening in America, you know what he found as a similar point between all of these revivals, many different places, many different people, many different education levels, some rich, some poor. You know what was in common in all of these? They were drenched in prayer. I met a guy, a pastor named Mike. I was at an event in Chicago. And Mike told a story of being called to come and pray at the altar. He said, Sean, I think it was the first and, and maybe the last time that, that I heard the audible voice of God speaking in my ear. And it was an Easter Sunday. And the, the reading of the word was, was causing him to come to a place of repentance and submission and recognizing that he needed God and that he could not do it on his own. And he began to weep and, and God said, come and pray at the altar. And he said he sat in his seat and he ignored the Lord. And after that, in his prayer time with God, God said this, I wanted to use you in that moment as an example of bringing a revival. And he began to repent saying, Lord, you know what? I, I, uh, I missed it and I'm sorry. And he, he made this commitment to God. He said, God, never again when you ask me to do something, will I not listen? He said, I'm taking the posture, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. It, it was not Easter anymore. It was the Sunday after Easter. And all the new people that had come on Easter, they, they weren't there. And, and, and he was wondering, God, could you still do something miraculous? So he went down to the altar. And he said a few people saw that and they came to the altar and, and people began to give their life to Jesus. And then the next week, he said he heard the same thing. And a few more people came forward and those people gave their life to Jesus. And then the next week, he heard the same thing. And he went forward and a few more people gave their life to Jesus. In their church, over the span of a year, almost 500 people gave their life to Jesus for the very first time because one man said this, God, you said it, I'm gonna do it. I'm listening, what do you want me to do? And guess what? He didn't preach. 
He didn't teach. He didn't tweet. He didn't quote. He just came up to the altar, got on his knees and said, God, you are Lord and you are king and I'm submitted. So do whatever you want to do. And one by one, people started coming to Jesus. Oh, that challenged me. I don't know if you saw, but I was up here tonight. I was up here tonight because because this is my challenge to you as much as it is a challenge to me. I, I want to pray more than I consume. This is what God's been convicting me of. He said, Sean, you've become a great consumer. And, and your generation, you just you just love to consume. You you love new. You you love to you, you love to buy, you love excess, you just, you want more, you, you want more feeling, you, you, you want more goosebumps, Sean, you, you want me to do this, and you want me to do that, and, and you ask, and, and you ask for this, and you ask for that, and, and you don't stop enough and just say, God, n- not, not what I want, Lord, but what you want, and God, I'm, I'm just going to sit here, I'm going to sit here at the altar, and I'm going to empty myself of everything that I want, and God, Whatever you want, give it to me. Just tell me, Lord. Tell me to go left. Tell me to go right. Tell me to reconcile with them, God. Tell me to fix this relationship, Lord. Tell me how how I can say I'm sorry, even when I feel like I'm right, Lord. Just stir up in me love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, all long suffering. That one's hard. Let me tell you that one's hard. Some self-control. See, I want to I wanna be a person that, that prays that God's will would be done in my life, not just that I would consume what I want. And, and I think if a generation would move away from coming to church to get what they want and started coming to church to, to believe that, that God would heal and that God would restore and that God would renew and that God would revive and that the lost need to be found and that hurts could be healed and that God really is who he says he is, then I think things would start to change. And, and it doesn't have to happen 500 people at one time. Guess what? It could just be one person. Because you know what? The first Sunday of January 2008, when I gave my life to Christ, it wasn't anybody else, was it, Larry? It was just me right here at this altar. And when Mike told me that story, man, I began to weep. Why? Because God was reminding me, Sean, it's not always about the crowd. It's about the heart. And let me tell you, when, when people see your heart, they're attracted to it. And, and they want to know... How do I get healed like that? How do I find peace like that? How, how do I know that God is with me even in the midst of a storm? But family, I got to tell you this. You got to empty yourself of what you want and you got to start asking God for what he wants for you. And if we do that, oh, let me tell you this. I think that we could see the greatest revival the world has ever known. I think we could see lasting change. I think we could experience an awakening of the dead coming to life. I think we could see our neighbors and our family and the people at our jobs coming to Jesus, but we got to act like what we believe is really real. And we got to talk to God like he's really there. We got to stop ignoring him and tuning him out. Listen, in our lifetime, we have got to become a people of prayer. And I believe if we become a people of prayer, then God will move. Because here's what you find in scripture. Every time more than one person gets together and they pray in the name of Jesus that God's will would be done, God does something. He does something. He changes someone. He he moves something. Hearts are stirred. Do you know how many times my Aunt Mary prayed for me that God would move that God would stir and then she had the boldness when God finally did to get all the way to California and to stand up in front of me and say pray to that God that I've been praying to and he could change your life forever that's how I got to this altar I didn't get to this altar because one day I just woke up and I realized oh I just really need Jesus no somebody was praying for me somebody got out of themselves they said it's not about what I want God it's about what you want for them because I want them to be close to you Lord revive us revive us because God our prayers are often dead dead prayers are selfish prayers Dead prayers are prayers that just desire for God to do what you want him to do, not what he wants to do. 
So tonight, as you stand to your feet, I just want you to take a moment, stand to your feet wherever you are. And I just want to declare this truth. Emily, if you could just lead us in this, just declare this truth. Your way is better. Maybe you need to raise your hands or maybe you need to come down to the altar. Maybe you need to get on your knees for a moment. Maybe you need to be reminded that that your way is not better, that, that you are a consumer by nature and that revival happens when you start thinking outside of yourself and you start praying to a real God that is really there and really moving and you start listening to his voice. It started with one pastor coming to an altar. What would it look like tonight if we worshiped him in spirit and in truth of the same faith and of the same heart? So however God is calling you, can we just sing this out to you tonight? Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Come on, church. Don't just sing it. Pray it to the Lord. Do you believe that tonight? His way is better. Shake up the ground of all my Shake it up, God. Break down the walls of all my religion. Don't be afraid to be bold. Don't be afraid to be honest before the Lord. His way is better. Come on, Emily, sing it out. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my your way is better, your way is better, and I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to, and I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Yes, I will make room for you. To do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. To do whatever you want Come on, make that your prayer tonight. God, we to sing this out to you, Lord, you by faith, oh God. And I will make room for you to do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. I will make, and I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to, to do whatever you want to. Shake up, shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. Your way is better. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break down 
Emily's going to keep singing this in the background. And you can keep singing along, but, but here are some specific things that the Lord was bringing. He said, he said make room by letting go. And, and I, heard, I heard some specific things. Bitterness. Bitterness. If that's you, just by, by raising your hand right now, if that's you and want to let go of bitterness. Come on, put your hand. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we make room for you, God. Lord, we let go of bitterness, Lord God. And we ask for forgiveness, Lord, to forgive those that are undeserving, God. Lord, to let go of things that have calloused our hearts. To do whatever you want to. I also, I also heard the Lord saying confusion. If there's anybody that's feeling confusion about how to go about a situation or, or what to do in this season, if that's you, just, just say, that's me. Feeling confusion. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, whatever you want, God. Lord, Lord, we pray, God, that we would not strive to get the answer, Lord God, but we would actively wait on the answer, Lord. Lord, bring understanding, God. Bring clarity on how to move forward, Lord. God, your people are asking you to show them, Lord, the way, the truth, the life. Lord, you promised that you would give us an answer. Lord, if it's a no, let it be a no, Lord God. If it's something else, let it be something else. If it's yes, Lord God, let there be no more confusion, Lord. But we're asking for solidarity, sound mind, Lord God. To do whatever you want to. Yeah. To do whatever the, you want. The last thing I heard the Lord saying was, was pray for hurting hearts. If, you're, if your heart is hurting, if somebody's hurt you and you've been, you've been holding that, say that's me. If you've been holding that, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, we release that now in the name of Jesus by the blood of Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we will no longer carry that pain and that hurt. God, we release that, Lord, for the people that thought we did something we didn't do. Lord, for the people that perceived us wrong for the way that we led in that situation. God, we give it up to you, Lord. We give their perception, their misunderstanding up to you. And we see this, Lord God, as an opportunity, Lord, for you to fill us with something new. So we just sing this out. Could we just worship this for a couple more seconds? Emily, just continue to lead us. Make room for him. As you release these things, let it be a prayer. Not just a song that you sing, but belief and faith. We make room for you, God. Do whatever you want to, Lord. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want. Come on, sons and daughters, he hears you. And I will make room for you. God, we make room for you, Lord. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make, and I will make room for you. Lord, do whatever you want to, God. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. So God, your people, we've gathered together tonight, Lord, not to play church, but to worship you in spirit and in truth. And, and God, we're asking tonight, not by way of a, an emotional experience, but by way of encountering the presence of God that each and every person in here would leave different, Lord. That, that they would let things go so that, that they could let new things in. God, for those that have felt like, like they, they must be deaf because they're not hearing your voice, God, speak loudly to them. May they, may they know that they are your sheep as they hear your voice, oh God. Lord, tonight for those that specifically there's somebody in here you just feel blind you feel blind you're like God why can't I see it why can't I see it the way they see it 
Lord, Lord, we put down comparison. And tonight, God, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to feel, Lord God, to know that you are alive and you are well. You are not an idol made out of wood or metal, Lord. Lord, and, and you did not stay on the cross, but God, you got off the cross and you died for our sins, but resurrected to the right hand of the Father. And so you are our covering, oh God. Jesus, you are our advocate. You are constantly, even when we don't know what to do or what to say by way of the gift of the Holy Spirit, even in groans, interpreting to the Father what his children need. So Lord, do whatever you want to, God. Let that not be an empty promise from unbelieving people, but a truth spoken by your sons and daughters that believe, Lord, that you are really moving, that you are really here, that you are really stirring, and that you could really use each and every one of them. For that person that didn't receive that, that you could use, God, each and every one of them. Let this all be, God, for your glory, for your honor, and for your praise. We worship you, Lord, because you are worthy of our conversation. God, you are worthy of our adoration. We come to you with thanksgiving, Lord, and we petition, God, on behalf of those that don't know, Lord, even to pray to you. God, we pray on their behalf. Forgive them as you've forgiven us. And Lord, send us, send us, God, Send us changed and healed, renewed and restored, revived and awakened by the power that comes to live in us and move through us. Pray all of these things in the matchless and the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, a loud and an honest amen. Come on, give God some praise, amen. We believe it, Lord. Let it be so. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, family, we just want to bless you and thank you for being here. Joel and Larry, pastors, can you come up here for just a moment? Um, I, I feel an anointing on Pastor Larry to bless you and send you and to tell you to go get his grandkids from Moana and pick them up before you eat your food. And if you brought an offering, we have boxes in the back and ushers in the back as well. I think tonight was just more room for the Lord. Amen? Amen. Um, so who's going to bless? All right. Would you receive the blessing? The Lord has been among us. Yes. He is with us. Amen? Amen. Now in the name of the Father who created you and then sent his own son to save you and who listens to your faintest prayer. And in the name of Jesus, who died and rose again, that you might have life and life to the full. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, who leads and guides you into an ongoing, life-giving conversation with him through all your days, may you go in the reality and the power, the love and the joy of being able to speak in prayer to the living God. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you. We love you, church. Amen.